start. Oh. So the the first item is just roll call. Uh, would you like to take roll, Allison? Yes, thank you. Committee member Haroff? Yes, I'm here. Committee member Paulson? Here. Committee member Wagstaff? Here. And I'll note committee member Kunzler is absent. Thank you. Um, and then the next item, the second item on the agenda is approve the minutes of the September 14th, 2022 meeting. Does anyone I'll move that. Make... A yeah. second. All right, and I'll uh, call roll with committee member Haroff. Yes. Approved. Committee member Paulson. Yes. Committee member Wagstaff. Yes. Okay, so the first or the first discussion item is to consider and discuss a draft pro housing application and pro housing programs to incorporate into the draft housing element. And I have, oh, I, I think I have, I have the spreadsheet that I could go through with y'all, but I wanted to just explain that the pro, um, our, count, our housing consultant actually recommended we consider this pro housing application since it does give the city uh, a leg up for any sort of grant applications. And there's a number of grants and they, the state keeps adding more and more to them. So if we did apply for a grant, um, it definitely helps the city to be in a more competitive position than other communities. And um, so that's the benefit of doing the program. And I, at first I looked at it and was a little concerned about that it might be too much, the requirements may be too much for staff. Um, and the housing consultant was hoping that we would think inspirationally and um, or aspirationally and include some of the policies and as programs in the housing element. But then when I started going through the application, I think I came up with enough points just based on the city's current programs and the ones that we have undertaken already, like the objective housing standards and our new permit um, website permit program. So I believe the city might qualify for this program now. And so I'm going to be asking the city council for permission to just apply. And then it's an, they call it an over the counter application. So I would be able to work with someone at HCD to see um, if we do apply or if we need to add additional programs to, to meet the program requirements. Um, but I thought it would be an interesting application for the committee to review since there are a number of programs um, in there that the city is not currently doing. And I wanted to know if anyone, um, or if you had any ideas or things that you really wanted to include. And I don't know the best way to go over this since there's about 50 lines of, of uh, programs. Although some of them, some of them we're already doing, um, but we could go, we could either go through or if there's any, if anyone else has an idea of um, how you might want to discuss, discuss this, uh, be- Yeah, at least I, I, could you? Yeah, I think what you just said about grants and over the counter, if you could give us a little more high level. So I think you and I talked about this offline and I was really interested in, you know, the pro and and maybe you can just give us some background, like, you know, based on the current housing element, you know, what we're trying to do with the, you know, the, you know, all the meetings we've had so far, how it might fit in. Oh, so, so, um, I mean, the pro is that we, qualify for more grants if we found grants that were applicable and the kind of grants that i'm specifically hoping that we would be able to get are things that um for example putting in sidewalks and bike paths in areas like the where the trailer parks are that don't have the same improvements as other communities in larksburg do um or and possibly other transportation grants we might qualify for um and then i don't know if you want me to just go over like this so there's a number of what else would you like me to go over for in terms of like a look at the spreadsheet? Um, one of the one of the things that gets us the most points is actually uh, identifying adequate sites on our on our draft housing element for um, one hundred fifty percent of the re our draft arena. And the city has identified um, two hundred thirty one percent. So we'll we'll definitely get that one as the uh, assuming the the draft is approved. Um, as the city goes through the housing element. Uh, so that's another kind of easy threshold. Some of the other ones relate to um, a ministerial processing, which is certainly a controversial thing um, 
in any community, um, but it, I think particularly it would be an issue. Um, well, I don't know if it's so much an issue, but almost um, one of the concerns is about, or they would like us to encourage more types of housing in single family neighborhoods, which sounds, sounds good on paper, but in reality, I think there's not a lot of motivation due to the high, um, the high demand for single family homes here that the prices are so expensive that actually converting them to rental units doesn't really pencil out. It would only be if the city allowed, I think um, like four condominium units that someone would actually have some motivation to re redevelop a single family sites for some sort of multiple housing project. Um, so those ones, I just, I, I think that it would be a lot of work and we also wouldn't get a lot of units out of that since I think the demand is just so high for single family homes, but I'm happy to get your feedback on that. It just was not one that I thought would be very successful in Larkspur. And then there's also a number of them that encourage just making the permit process more stream or the hearing process more streamlined. And, and that's, I think that's possibly something that the city could accomplish. I don't, I don't expect that even the larger projects would need too many hearings. Um, but that, so it's, it's another thing that the city could consider if the, I think they want the limit to be maybe five hearings, um, which is not too outrageous. If you think of something going through the planning commission a couple times and maybe one public hearing, um, with, as a workshop and one city council appeal. Um, Lisa, if, if we did the application now, um, and you got the over-the-counter approval, like, yes, it looks good, you can get it. Uh, do we still have the discretion to not submit? Oh, uh, yeah, there's, I guess there's not really any downside to submitting. There's no penalty. If we don't make the points, we just don't qualify for the grant. So I'm okay. calculating we have 32 points. There's no downside. I My only downside worry was maybe in the future, the we'll get more arena if we're a pro housing community, but I can't imagine how that they would ever factor that in to the methodology um, to give us more. But that that was be my only worry, but I don't see why we couldn't also redact our application if, if we were worried about that. And I think the program only goes on till right now until 2025. So it's just a couple years of years of advantage. And does does Julian or Public Works have any thoughts? I mean, when you said bike paths and stuff, you know, looking at the capital improvements program, is there any well, gaps where you see well, really they, good figures? They definitely have mentioned there's gaps with with side, sidewalk projects. So there's there's items in our capital improvement plan that just don't have funding for sidewalks. So I think that if if there's any pockets of funding that we could get for those types of programs, it like it'd be great to have um, a little little leg up on grant applications. And we would be the only one so far in Marin that's applied. So it would be useful at least to Marin County also. Great, thanks. And and it um, it does send a message to HD that we're serious. So that uh, about no, developing housing. And and that's and that's useful because it keeps them off our back a little bit. Um, on the first point, can you just remind me exactly what it is that uh, we're um, what what is that point again? The first one, of the first of the two that you identified. Oh, um, sorry, on the whole list or just in general? Just on um, the ones that you just listed. You, you described uh, a ago. one of them. One of them was getting one hundred fifty percent of our arena, which I think will be easy to. We've already, we have, we've yeah, already done we're already that. there. Then the next one is um, permitting mis missing middle housing use uses such as duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes by right an existing low density okay that, that's housing. the one i was wondering about so yeah i just i don't I'd, like i said i don't i don't see that don't happening it, it wouldn't result in a lot of housing because of the demand and the cost of housing and the price right. of rental unless you go to really to um condominium units in which case they're not going to be affordable yeah so that's the only thing that worries me about this, and then this is obviously something that's come up in the context of the conversation about um, rent stabilization, um, is there is a there is a um, a concern that um, 
um, I, I, it's hard for me to describe it, but cor generally corporate interests, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, um, equity entities or whatever, whatever they are, will go and snap up um, houses and then just transition them into something else. And I don't know that we have protections against that, and but that that does that does worry me. I mean, and right, no... yeah, right now, right now we don't have protections because we haven't adopted these objective design and development standards, and we certainly aren't even looking at right. objective design standards for single family homes. So it does seem this is one that, if it was going to be a program, it would be probably a program to develop some sort of standards if. If you were going to go that direction, and, and that's, in there, yeah, that's, that could happen. That's that's the direction we've gone before, and you know, in in terms of objective design standards, and that, you know, I I'm, I've been reluctant but willing to go down that line. I just I, I worry a little bit about creating incentives for um, corporate interests to come in and start snapping up properties and then redeveloping them willy nilly just because they found a buyer that's willing to sell. To make money and then yeah. all of a sudden now they can redevelop in ways that are incompatible with the community what would be appealing is if they were affordable units um the problem yeah, is but they're not going to do that <laughs> right so yeah you could make a buy right for affordable units but the chances are that they wouldn't there wouldn't be much demand to build them and and where does the lot split um option come into play in this all this so they i i at least from I was speaking to someone who's applied from Sacramento and they were <clears throat> they were doing a program on this at my conference and they said we can't get credit for things that we're required to do under state law. So the SB9 does require us to allow duplexes um, and up to four units like so a, a lot to be subdivided and two units built on each, but we can't say we can't get credit for this program by saying we're doing that since we're required to do that under state law. So so the city already allows duplexes um, or what could be considered missing middle housing in single family under SB9. But what I don't understand with that is where our own standards, like uh, a lot needs to be 7,500 square feet come uh, into play. Yeah, for for SB9, they we can't apply our current standards. If we were to adopt um, new regulations to do something beyond what we're required to do under SB9, we could require a minimum lot size and we could we could have more objective standards. We could keep we could keep more of our standards because we would be making the rules ourselves. Okay. I think I think I understand. <laughs> um, so in a sense the city's doing this to an extent. It's just not um, they would give us more points if we went further than what state law requires. It's just, and it, given, it's just not a lot of, I don't expect a lot of units. I would rather focus the effort on things that might actually generate a, a more significant amount of housing. Um, so then the, one of the other ones is, um, the next ones is, is increasing the density bonus uh, by 10% or more. And, and that is also a concern just Right now, we're, uh, or it's something maybe it's still up in the air with development of the housing element programs. The city, um, yeah. the discussions that we've had with you in the past, um, there's been some um, support for increasing density on some of the sites, like in the Larkspur Landing area. But to 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 give 10% on top of that, it's I think it's it's a lot. So they're already entitled to a density bonus up to 50 to 80 percent if they uh, include affordable housing unless we need that for the grant application let's not yeah. do that no 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 i mean we don't really need anything for the grant application this is more are these programs you're interested in doing for the housing element and that's not one i don't i just i don't i think increasing the density is adequate for now um then Oh, increasing the number of ADUs allowed in single family residential neighborhoods. And and that like um, San Diego has done that. Some other jurisdictions allow more than two ADUs. Currently an ADU and a junior accessory dwelling unit are allowed per site. Um, it's again, another one that I, is not particularly, I think something I'd like to pursue because it the we, we aren't even seeing people develop the single family ADUs. And so I don't, 
I think it would be a lot of effort and um, concern for not very many units. No, I think that that's the right impulse. I I agree with that. And the the downside, the thing that hasn't been addressed is how you handle parking. I mean, we we don't meet our parking standards most of the time uh, as it is. Um, yeah, so. and also we have very few areas where ADUs are allowed because of the fire hazards. So uh, we're talking about a very a limited number of sites that would be able to develop additional units with no parking. Makes sense. <laughs> and and not doing it in this housing element or doesn't mean the city can't change its mind and do any of these programs at any time. It's just one that I I don't see is resulting in a lot of housing units, again, since we aren't getting regular ADUs. Um, then one of the next ones, I'm skipping over the ones that we're already doing. So one of the next ones is establishing a workforce housing opportunity zone or a housing sustainability district. And that we I would need to do more research on. It's one of the questions that Mr. Paulson had asked um, about. And I think it's something that might apply to the Larkspur landing area by giving incentives for projects that include 20% affordable housing, which we're already asking for through our inclusionary ordinance. But one of the downsides to some of these state programs is that they require um, payment of either union wages or prevailing wages. And that actually may deter development in our community. So I think it's something that we could look into for uh, definitely for Larks for Landing. The, the program seems to make sense for the community. It just needs a lot more research. And then um, and so, on that note, if we let's say hypothetically Larks for Landing, we have uh, a request for or whatever, you know, developers looking at building workforce housing. And so I think what you're saying is the, you know, the all the laborers are at a higher rate at union wages. And if that falls through, can you? resubmit as not you know can we change that zoning like not you know workforce house zoning or something like that uh, you know yeah so i mean this would require it, that would be something we have to look at is what it's entailed is it, it it seems like it's a pretty big effort to to put it as an overlay on the area and i'm not sure what the benefit is because we already require 20 percent affordable housing um and there's so many other states policies. I, I have, I imagine, I, I'd like to see what, what it's put in place for, like maybe it's for really larger areas that are generating um, as some type of encouragement for housing. So I have to say, I don't know enough about the program to, to recommend it or see what the upsides or downsides are yet. Do you know any other cities that are pursuing this? No, no, not yet. Um, or they, they, and there may be some that have it. I, I was actually asking the state that it, when they have programs like this, it would be useful if they could refer us to some examples. Yeah, and so, and some relevant examples. I mean, we are we are land constrained here in Larkspur, and the, you know the opportunities to to do things that maybe some other communities that are not constrained in that way could potentially do. Yeah, they, they're, they're just not relevant to us. And I and I do I do sincerely believe that if. I would be putting in a prevailing wage requirement to sort of deter housing. It's not going to be something that brings in. Projects. Yeah, it's 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 kind of odd. Um, but you know, in in my other with one of my other hats on, I mean, I had my MCE hat. We we are very consistent about requiring um, uh, 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 counterparties to be including prevailing wage provisions in the contracts that they are proposing, and that's just something that that we do. That said, that's completely different. That's a completely different set of circumstances, and I and I just don't know that we can we can deviate from that in in this context. Or it'd be good to know. Like I'd really like to talk to a community that's doing this and see if it's been deterring housing or if it doesn't at all. Yeah. Because the one thing that it would it seems like if there was a requirement like that in place, then the chances are the people who do want to build would be affordable housing developers that already have to meet those requirements. Right. So and they don't maybe care. there's and they don't care. So maybe. Maybe it encourages affordable housing, which would be good. So which, this which would be, I, I just which, yeah, that, and that would be fine. But I, I just want to make sure when we're looking at other examples of communities that are doing this sort of thing, let's make sure that we're doing apples to oranges. We're not doing apples to oranges. We're doing apples to apples. 
Um, we are not Roseville, for example. We are not a community that is uh, rich with potential land development opportunities. We just we just don't have those. So let's make sure that we're, when we're making comparisons, we're making comparisons that are relevant to our community. So this is one I, I would just like to explore more and maybe it ends up as a policy that you discuss <coughs> when you talk about the draft, because if there's some really good benefit to it, uh, we just need more information. Yeah, and that's fine. Um, and then there's some catch-alls at the end of each category for other other actions um, uh, that we're allowing higher density potentially in the um, in the light industrial district, which is where the cost plus development is. Uh, that might gain some points if that yeah, ends uh, up fine. in the housing element. I don't and know. Then, they'll, um, they'll do that, but that's fine. Yeah. Well, I guess they've expressed interest, so that's promising. Then a, a stream, one of the next ones is a streamlined program level CEQA analysis for documents. And the intent of this, I believe, is if we do a, a comprehensive CEQA document for areas, um, the hope is that then the developments don't have to do environmental review for every project that they could fall under that. And that would certainly be a goal um, if we are doing something, if we could afford ourselves to do a detailed CEQA analysis. So that, I don't I don't see that as, um, I think that's just something we would always keep in mind because of course yeah. it'll make it easier if we've already done the environmental review for any sort of project that we're doing. And for what it's worth, I, I you know, I've kind of moved my own mind about CEQA issues um, in that, and actually in that direction. It, it 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 really doesn't make a lot of sense to do detailed CEQA review uh, under circumstances where we've already done the legwork at, at the outset, and I'm I'm a lot more comfortable with that than I used to be. So that that's I think that's fine. Um, so there's some uh, documenting practice of streamlining housing development projects and. And we're considering doing that with a 20 unit project on Magnolia, but that hasn't gone through yet. We don't have um, enough of a track record to qualify for one of one of the points for um, streamlining housing development because we just don't have enough projects to or that we've considered yet. And then uh, this is one establishment of a permit process that takes less than four months for projects that don't need environmental review. And so far too, we don't have any projects that have taken less than four months. Part of that is because the applicants turn in incomplete applications. And so the projects might take a year, just even though we've told them a list of items that are needed on day one, they're just not turning in what we required or they right. change the project. So at this time, we just can't, I would, it would be great if we could offer a four month turnaround time, but I don't think yeah, it's we possible. can't promise that. <laughs> right. Um, then absence or elimination of public hearings for projects consistent with the zoning and the general plan. Um, I, I think that's a, also a pretty serious change for Larkspur. I think things will be different when, when you've adopted objective design standards because then it wouldn't be so critical to have a public hearing process. But at this time, we don't have any design standards at all. So I mean, other than some basic floor area height and setback requirements. So that, that wouldn't right. be one I would recommend at this time. But but in the future when we have objective standards and there's if that could be definitely feasible. Then I'm going to skip over. We have a whole bunch that we are doing. Uh, again, limiting the number of hearings. If that could be possible, that could be possible to do. It might be something worth looking at it in the future. Um, and then some of them are uh, oh the universal. Adoption of a universal design ordinance. Um, and that is something that I know um, one of the council members has expressed an interest in. I know Petluma has done it and Alameda has done it. And that would require uh, the model ordinance, at least that's been put out by the state. So someone's already written the ordinance. The city would just consider adopting it, would require every unit to be, they call it visitable. So any disabled person could re visit any resident of a new housing development. And then it also requires a certain number of the housing units to be fully accessible for disabled. Um, so I, I think that would be something I, I would like to include as something to consider in the housing element. I agree with that. Okay. 
E2. Yes. Uh, and then approved pre-approved or prototype plans for missing middle housing types like duplexes, triplexes, and single family areas. The this is just another one that we I think tackling objective standards for single family residential is um, a project that's that should come after the multifamily housing objective standards are completed. Again, since we, I don't expect a lot of demand for that. Um, and also the risk of um, losing historic houses that may not be listed yet if we're allowing um, development by right in some of our single family neighborhoods. So it wouldn't, that just wouldn't be what I'd recommend right now. Oops. Let's see, and then some of them are just financial. So in terms of grants, this is, this is a number of the last ones are in terms of grants. Um, grants for ADU and JDU construction for lower and moderate income households. Um, I don't, I don't, there's no, I have no objection to that. It's just a matter of dedicating funding for that. And that might be something again to, to include as a policy in the housing element. But a lot of it just depends on on where the where the funding is going to come from. Yeah, and that's we can't decide that in this context. Yeah, but and then um, a comprehensive program that complies with the Surplus Land Act. Um, and I put some information in the report that we don't have a lot of surplus land to come up with a surplus land program. There's really um, there's like the, of course, the town hall site where I'm sitting right now could be declared surplus if, if you wanted to do something else with the property, but the city council is already discussing that. So um, the other the other lots we have are all pretty much parks already and, and ones that are really suitable for parks. So it just doesn't seem like a program worth pursuing um, just because there's not enough land to, to dedicate. Correct. And then there's another one that I would need more information on, which is the establishment of an enhanced infrastructure financing district, which is like a financing tool. Um, this is again in an area where at least 20% of the residences will be affordable to housing. This seems really complicated, although it may not be. Um, and I think if we were to pursue something like that, we'd want some sort of feasibility analysis to see if it's even worthwhile pursuing. But there may be a cost in even getting the feasibility analysis. So it's another one um, that I would just, I think we need to do more research to find out yeah. if any smaller jurisdictions have used something like this. And if, and if we have enough lots that are going to redevelop to make it work. I don't know if um, Mr. Paulson or if any of you know anything more about um, enhanced infrastructure financing districts, but no, I, I mean I sent you those links, and I'm I'm also, you know, just starting to do the reading. So I I was mostly hoping that we don't miss anything, and you know I I also don't want to introduce extra work or complexity. But it sounded like the you know the pro in general doesn't have many downsides, and you know some of the others you know may. So what might be nice is if we just you know with the time we have come up with a, a list of like this. Would probably help the city and this wouldn't and you know pursue it on that basis so i i didn't want to say i think all these are great ideas i just kind of realized we're doing this huge document and you know, there's a lot of options out there and i just didn't want to miss it you know for you know the committee here the steering committee to discuss yeah yeah no i think it's i think it's worth keeping uh, like something to consider for the housing element but we need more research on it and then really we've gotten through the whole list so i think i have some some in there that i um, that we could suggest including in the housing element, unless there's other things that you want to talk about for this particular item. No, as long yeah, as you feel can... comfortable that we're we're teed up to to get the application for the uh, for the grants, that's yeah good enough for me. I mean, just the, the then... minimum we need to do in order to make a, a saleable grant application. The um, we do have one person in in our audience, Ross Gerling. He's um, he's associated with one of the projects that lurks for landing. So please raise your hand if you have anything to add at during the meeting. But he's not he's not raising his hand. Um, so the next item on the agenda was to talk about 
um, new housing laws and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission Transit Oriented Community Policy. I'm going to go over the Transit Oriented Community Policy kind of quickly because it's another one. I have a presentation I could share. Um, this is um, important. Let me get my screen share going. This is important because um, essentially all of the funding for transportation is going to be probably tied to um, compliance with these requirements. I'm going to put up, let's see, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint now. Yep. So the Metropolitan Transportation Commission established recently a transit-oriented community policy. And where this is going is um, they're trying to implement the programs of the Plan B area 2050. And in order to do that, one of the, they're trying to encourage development of housing and offices near transit hubs. And so they're gonna also be directing their funding to those communities as a priority. So it, it's important in that if we don't have a trans, if we don't have a transit or community policy, the city may just not qualify for funding from MTC, which is a, a pretty big deal. Um, so I wanted to see how far we, what we'd have to do to qualify for a transit or community policy, because maybe these are things too that we can incorporate into the, the housing element. So on this map, I'm, these yellow sites are the ones that qual, um, that are part of this transit or community policy, since it applies to any sites within a half a mile of a major of major transit, which for us is the Larkspur Ferry Terminal as well as the Smart Station, but they've also modified the policy. It's been amended over the last probably six months. Um, they modified it to exclude any areas that already have housing development, which made this a lot more um, I guess doable or easy to consider for Larkspur because um, initially it, it would have acute. Uh, included all of the Green Bay single family residential no zones, which would have been really difficult to um, upzone to a high density. Uh, and then <laughs> it, would, it would cause a tremendous amount of grief for those of us who it, live there. It would. And so I'm glad they eliminated any sites that have housing and in the attempt to not displace residents, which is good too. So we're limited to just these sites in the Larkspur Landing area. They're all developed sites with the exception of um, the sewer agency site. And so in order to qualify uh, for to be a transit oriented to community and then receive transportation funding, they're requiring a minimum density of 20 units an acre in these areas and 35 units an acre, which this is the density that we were discussing for the Larkspur Landing area anyway. So um, this actually seems like something that could be feasible if that's adopted as part of the housing element um, draft. Currently, we're, the city of Larkspur only allows 21 units an acre. And then for commercial, this is the one that's the most um, difficult for me is uh, where commercial office uses are allowed, we'd have to allow a, a one FAR, so essentially 100% of the lot size would have to be allowed for a minimum office floor area. And then that allowable maximum density is three. So essentially three stories over 100% of the lot, or you could do multiple stories in a smaller building. So that's a big change for the city. Let me go back to the map so I can show you. Um, what's unusual about this area is that it's got a planned development zoning, and but then the the zoning looks at the under some underlying um, there's some underlying programs in the general plan that indicate how the sites would be used. So right now the general plan would only allow office uses in sort of these areas on the west side of Marin Country Mart. Um, so I think that it might be possible to comply with that policy if we limited office uses to certain lots in this area. So um, if, if, for example, we said office uses are only allowed on these lots, um, it, it may be possible to meet um, those required, or we could allow those, the one and three FAR for just a certain number of sites and we would comply with the policy. There's no requirement that anyone actually build that. It would just be something that someone would have the um, the the right to to build. Um, the the challenge too is we don't want to make it appealing for someone to build office and then not have the sites developed for housing. So 
um, the minimum FAR would, or the minimum density for housing would also be critical to make sure that someone doesn't just come in for a 300% office project with no housing. Yeah, why, why would we even want to encourage that? I mean, I, we're, no, we're it's, struggling with the housing <laughs> issue. It, yeah. Right, I, it's really, it's bothersome that they included that, but the, I think the reason is really because under Plan Bay Area, they're trying to get office spaces near transit so that people aren't driving, so that they're using transit to get to work. And so they want to encourage new office development near major transit. I, I'd really be reluctant to go down that path. I don't really see that that's, we, we have plenty of office space already that's underutilized, I think, in our community. Community. I don't. I don't know why we'd want to do that in a way that would actually jeopardize our ability to meet our make our meet our housing obligations. That doesn't Absolutely. make that doesn't make any sense to me. And I wanted to get some feedback on that. This one's the most challenging, unless we really limit it, limit it to a couple of sites, which sounds like would work um, in terms of passing their their policy. Yeah, but what sites would they be? I mean, there's like a couple of I mean, the the old. Uh, the, the theater property. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what's over there that would accommodate that kind of development. Yeah, it would be a tall, either a tall building or yeah. essentially covering the entire site with office right. development. And and the people who live in Green Bay who have to look across the freeway into that community don't want to look at skyscrapers. They just don't. So I just don't see that that's a direction we want to go. And then two, I wanted you to be aware of just as council people, so you're, because you might be hearing more and more about this policy, and especially when transportation funding comes up. But it, this is the kind of feedback I wanted to, to hear from you. Um, and then there's also policies that the city would need to adopt for affordable housing production, preservation and protection, which I actually think none of those, if, if we wanted to participate in this um, program, there's programs in here that the city could adopt. There's nothing that, um, some of the things you're talking about right now and some of the things might become programs through the housing element. So um, right now, the only thing we have is inclusionary housing, but there's certainly other, other programs that the city could participate in. Um, the same with housing preservation. Um, we have mobile home preservation. We would just need one more of these other items. Um, like making our condominium conversion restrictions a little tighter um, or funding um, funding other programs. So I don't, we don't need to go through each of these, but um, just know that I think that these ones wouldn't be that difficult to um, comply with. And then to the um, anti-displacement policies, you're considering a lot of those right now as you're talking about rent stabilization. So there might be some programs that come out of that that um, could qualify us for the the transit oriented community policy. So that that's actually that raises a good question because we are considering that and um, we will hopefully be moving along with those issues over the next. I mean, I don't know. I I, I don't want to predict how long it's going to take us to get through all this stuff, but it could be a matter of less than six months. It, it, does that create a problem for us if we? Do? You know what. They haven't come up with guidelines um, for timelines. I'm expecting that they're going to give communities time to comply with all these requirements since they're not going to happen overnight. Yeah. And they're also, they're intending to give communities technical assistance on a lot of these programs. So there should be more coming well, out of nice. MTC. So even if, even if we don't qualify for the transitory community, we might be able to take advantage of some more assistance from a bag MTC on development of some of these programs, and, and that and that'd be great. I'm just, my question was just more, mostly on the timing issue. I mean, because we, oh, yeah. so we are considering right now, we don't these know. issues. We I, don't. We right, don't. We don't yeah. know. I think but, you would you would probably beat them for the for the program. Is my guess. I don't. I don't think they're expecting anyone to comply that quickly. Okay. But I could be, yeah, we, I could be we, wrong. We may be ahead of them. I don't know. Yeah, you might. Oh, well, he's um, got quick question. Oh, sure. Sorry, sorry, just um, uh, one step back. We were talking about, you know, hypothetically in Larkspur Landing, you know, something with a density, you know, 20, 30 units and, you know, and then the, you know, 
common of, you know, like high rises. What can, can you say specifically what that might look like? You know, is there, cause we had a lot, you know, about what we thought, uh, you know, the number of stories could or should be. I mean, are we taught something that would be three or four stories and still qualify for this? And then the second question is, you know, what sort of money, you know, think, you know saw that the grant might be useful for our, uh, you know, um, uh, infrastructure, you know, for sidewalk. Not what? How could we possibly use stuff here? You know, it's public work cited. You know, is, is there anything? You know, do you see a, side, you know, of what they have and what we need, a, a kind of a match? Um, well, I think that I think that a lot of the funding programs for transportation that that fund most of the transportation projects are going to be impacted by this program. So um, it would probably be a good question for Julian and Public Works. Um, but for example, the One Barrier Grant programs, it, it's funding, they, they receive a lot of funding from federal programs that are administered by MTC. So it could have a hit, definitely have a hit on the city if, if we're not a transit-oriented community. Um, they, this is another one of the things they haven't come out with yet. So the next step will be for their funding program, um, they haven't they haven't said with that for certain yet that we're only going to fund transit oriented communities. But so we we still are waiting for information on that. And then maybe by that point, right. Julian could give us more information as to what what that really means. Like we can't get a sidewalk grant because we're not a transit oriented community or. Right. And we're sort of in a unique position. I mean, of the 11 municipalities, I, you know, Novato, San Rafael, I can't really think of anyone else who has the same, you know, kind of nexus we do, you know, with the large landing, you know, and I, I mean, even Corte Madera. Yeah. Tiburon is going to comply because yeah. they have a ferry stop. So they'll be similarly challenged um, in terms of a, essentially a suburban community that's, that's being asked. So one of the questions was about number of stories. So if we look at if something needs to have, um, if we can't, if we have to allow a three, three FAR, so essentially covering a lot three times in stories for office, and then we have a 25 unit an acre minimum for housing that would have to go on top of that. So that's that's ass that's assuming the building's covering the whole site, you know, at least four or five times. So that's four or five right off the bat. Um, chances are, even though parking is not required, and we'll get to that later, someone may want to put in parking or do something with the surface of the, not not just have a, um, you know, property line to property line building, but have some sort of landscaping. Um, so then the building just gets taller and taller. So it it does require um, several story buildings. Um, and the what we had talked about with the objective design standards so far was. Um, I think in this area, there was some areas that would be allowed five and could go up to seven with affordable housing. Um, but I think you'd be looking at, I mean, you would, I would think a minimum of four so, stories. So, so up to seven stories? Um, I think that's with the, den with the density bonus, the, the, the zone that you were looking at would allow for. I thought we decided not. Not th th this that. this community would never tolerate that. <laughs> so I, I will make sure when the objective design standards come back, you'll definitely want to pay attention to that. So if it, if we did three that goes up to five, that might have been the standard that you were that you were thinking of. Um, so and which is still a tall building for Larkspur, um, but one of the zones was three to five, and one's five to seven. I thought it was five to seven in this zone, but we could we can. You'll be considering those standards again. Um, what I'm trying to say is just that if they would be much taller than that, even I think seven would be. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if someone was doing seven if we had to do uh, three hundred percent FAR plus twenty five units an acre. I just don't see how I just don't see that the community would tolerate that. It's it's a lot of the the three hundred percent FAR is a lot for office. Um, yeah, so it's that's an issue. Um, and and if we were if we were like Emeryville, it would not be that big of a deal, but but we're not. But we're not Emeryville. And I don't think anybody wants us to be Emeryville. Um, 
at so, least with the with the I was just going to ask, um, so that, you know, if we did the, um, you know, uh, transit, you know, type of templates, would they into the ultimately, and there would be like for multifamily the allowance for seven stories or something? I mean, I'm just wondering how this will look in final review. Like if we went that way, the final place where that happens for developers to go to the ODS, you've got that maximum height. So I'm sorry, I missed some of the beginning. You were cutting out a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I'm just um, this technical. So say you know we, we did consider this, um, would it then modify the objective design standards? And I think we were looking at the various templates that developers would use, and one of the templates then have like down or whatever plus stories, and that that would be a modification to what we've seen so far. Uh, maybe and maybe not. So depending on if we. If you were going down the direction of the five to seven story ones, um, that that would just be adding additional stories. So um, I think it, it might be fairly similar, actually, for the three to five story objective design standards. It'll be interesting to see when you see the draft, but it may be a matter of just adding stories to to the standards. So the the first few stories are going to have the most standards, and then everything ab above that is just repeating the the design. Um, so it could be. It could be something that is included in the objective design standards. The it would it would be good to look at, of course, just what that what that would look like in reality in the Larkspur landing area. So, if someone was coming in with this, it would look building. like Emeryville. That's what it would look like, and I don't think we can do that. Okay, thanks. So, I mean, I might my question just more how how this gets. Off. I mean, the programs you've gone over, where where do they ultimately codify it? I'm not I'm not trying to comment on whether they're desirable or not. Sorry, you're you're breaking up with the phone. Um. Yeah, so at least I'm saying I'm just wondering where things get codified. I'm not I'm not commenting on whether they're desirable. Uh, so yeah, we would just change the zoning. We would change the zoning to a, allow additional floor area in that Larkspur landing area or anywhere near. Um, a half mile of a transit stop, and then the objective standards could cover could cover those projects. I, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm sorry, because you're breaking up. Yeah, that does. That's fine. Thanks. Okay. And then one of the other parts of the transit community policy is to protect local businesses that might be displaced um, in in those areas. And there are some small and local businesses in the Larkspur Landing area. Um, so it would just be another policy that the city would need to consider if you wanted to go down the transit oriented community route. Um, and then the parking is interesting because the parking standards would be, we would not be able to require as much parking as we do today. However, the state recently passed a law that um, essentially eliminates parking requirements within a half a mile of a major transit stop. So we would be able to comply with this policy pretty easily because we are already required to um, comply with it under state law. So we may need to add additional parking for bicycles. Um, I believe the state law even allows unbundled parking. I know we'd had this conversation about parking a couple of meetings ago, but for areas within a half mile of transit, um, we, I believe the city still has to allow unbundled parking, which means that they could um, rent or sell spaces um, detached from the residential units. And then the city already allows shared parking between uses, so I don't see that as a big concern. No, that's so, not a big deal. Yeah, I don't think the park, so essentially the parking requirements are not a deal breaker for participating. It just comes comes back to the to the office required office space. And then there's some requirements for transit station access and circulation. And these are things that I think also the city would want to pursue anyway, if we had funding and through these um, through this program, there might be funding available to do some studies for gap analysis in terms of seeing where, how, how we improve access for pedestrians and bicyclists sure, sure. and those that are disabled. So this one, again, um, I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be some resources to help us do these types of studies because there are things that I think the community would support. Yeah, the, 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 those are absolutely things the community would support. Yeah, so that, that again, is a deal, deal breaker. Anyway, so that's it for um, 
transit-oriented communities, it's good to get the feedback. I think, you know, have, trying to figure out how to make the office area work, I think will be something, um, hopefully that MTC and ABAG will provide some guidance on and, and we'll see what other communities say when they have to consider it too, especially Novato and San Rafael and Tiburon. But that that one, that's the hurdle that I think is the yeah. hardest to get over. Tiburon would be an interesting example. I can't imagine them doing much of anything. And they may have they have may have housing on so many other sites. There may be very few sites that this even applies to. I can't imagine any sites over there. Me neither. <laughs> um, so the only the other thing I, that was on the agenda was to give go over some housing laws with you. And I could make this really brief. I just wanted to give you some. Um, I would. I have some slides that I that were presented at a workshop that I went to over the weekend. It's a lot of um, a lot of text. So, but I could go over them just quickly, just so you have some idea of what's coming down the pipeline for housing laws. Um, Let's see if I could figure out which screen I'm on. Just make here. sure you don't give me a heart attack when you go through it. Uh, there's some that are some that are a little worse than others here. Um, so the the these are the attorneys, Eric Phillips, that and um, one of the planning associations lobbyists that did the presentation. So I'm just stolen their sides slides and would like to give them credit for that. Um, and I just picked out the ones that were more relevant to Larkspur. And one of them is um, AB 211 and SB 6. That's creating um, a ministerial process for some projects that are in commercial zones, and the city, the city already allows uh, residential development in commercial zones. So, this, I haven't gone through this with a fine cone to see how exactly it's going to apply to Larkspur, but it's it's essentially one of the one of uh, the laws that we're seeing that makes it uh, a requirement for us to approve housing projects and areas that meet certain requirements. Um, and again, this one I would imagine would not be taken advantage of as much because it does have requirements for um, prevailing wages and um, which seems to be something that deters applicants in Marin County from trying to take advantage of some of these requirements like SB 35 is another one where I, I don't think too many people have been seeing SB 35 projects because it also requires prevailing wages to be paid if, if there's 10 or more units. Um, and then there's affordability requirements, um, which would be good things if someone was coming in with a project that had affordable units. So uh, it, I'll, I'll go through them in more detail and see how they apply to Larkspur. And, but just so you know that there's um, new laws that would that would require the city to approve housing in some commercial areas. And then there's going to be standards for how they're developed that I still need to look into too to see. I, I mean, they're they look very generous, <laughs> but um, sixty-five. Again, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're looking at that again, if if we're required to approve certain projects, it might there might be we might revisit some of the other things that we have in our housing element. It just might I don't know, like the other like the third office building part, um, if there's things that we're forced to do anyway, it might have us look at it through a different lens. Um, and then one of the other things that was really interesting is they come up, they've come up with um, something that applies to planning projects, which is sort of a, a shot clock and streamlining of building permits, which um, the city actually has, a, again, um, we try to get back to people quickly with our permit reviews. Um, and oftentimes things are delayed because the applicants haven't submitted the information. But um, is this am I reading? Sorry, present all Yeah, this is true. So there's there's certain requirements for um, the city to streamline um, building permit applications for housing developments, which I think is a good thing. Um, I don't expect that we'll have trouble complying with the requirements. It's just and it's going to be required for everyone. There's also requirements for us to have online permitting, which we're already planning to do. And uh, one of the things that's a little interesting is they're requiring us to put on the internet examples of five building permits or for five different housing types um, that have been approved. Like five, this is five housing types that have received a building permit approval. And um, I'm hoping that we could work with the other jurisdictions of Marin to come up with some permits to put on the website 
so that we're um, since and or actually anyone in the Bay Area, hopefully ABAG will help us to comply with those requirements um, since we're all having to post the same thing on our, the internet. So um, quick, quick question, if somebody comes in with a super ugly 25 unit building, um, do you have to pass it in 30 days? Is that? Oh, this Well, this is more with the building permit application. So it would have already gone through, it could have uh, already been, it could have already been ministerially approved because we have to for a super ugly building um, through planning, which would have also had its own timelines. And then when they come in with the building to building, the building department just has to process it quickly. Well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing to object to. It's just, an in, it's interesting that they've gone into the building department world too. Um, and then also requiring us to post the requirements for building permit. These are all good things that we should be doing anyway. So um, having really clear lists of what's required and then only requiring those things as the project goes through. So it's I don't see it as a, a bad thing and I think it would improve our own permit process to have a lot of these things. Uh, then there's some a number of changes to the density bonus ordinance. Um, this one, add some height, um, I guess your, your pictures are in my way here, but um, add, added height and unlimited density um, if 80% of the units are restricted to low-income housing. So Marin's included in this requirement. Um, we, don't, we don't see that many projects like, that would include 100% affordable housing. Um, the sewer agency site certainly is one that could uh, benefit from this law, uh, but just something to be aware practical of. Practical matter that they, not even that property is going to take advantage of this. Yeah, it's it's just not going to. And, and in a sense, we already have to allow this anyway. Um, it's not if someone came in with a hundred percent affordable housing project or something that's significant, they're going to be asking for exceptions to all of our rules to do that. Yes, yeah. I would expect. Um, and then there's new accessory dwelling unit bills that, and the, this is one of the ones that's a doozy, is um, it increases the height limit from, from 16 feet to 18 feet. And then also, um, well, this one applies to multifamily sites with multifamily dwellings, but then also for ADUs attached to the primary dwelling, it allows them to go 25 feet or the height limitation in the zoning ordinance. Um, so, and that, I, I think the intent of this was to allow ADUs to be built over garages. So um, that would allow a taller to use them than the 16 feet that the city's currently allowing. And then we'll update our zoning ordinance that it- Yeah, we can work with comes, that. Yeah, it'll, I mean, we have to. <laughs> um, and then the parking minimums I've already sort of talked about, which is essentially that we can't require parking for sites within a half mile of the ferry terminal and the, and the smart station so that, it, it helps us in that we don't have to have the discussion about parking and reducing parking requirements because we're gonna have to do that um, next year. And I think that was where I ended it. Those are just the ones that are mainly applicable to Larkspur. The one with the mixed use um, allowing by right mixed use, I have to do more research on to see exactly how it, how it would apply in the city. I'm sorry to breeze through that so quickly. No, 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 but... that, that's fine. <laughs> The, the moral of the story on the on the parking issue is that since we don't have to impose any parking requirements for new development over Larkspur Landing, all those people are going to be parking in my front yard. Um, I think too, there's no prohibition on developers mm. providing parking. So I'm I'm sure there will be developers that want to provide parking on some of these projects too, especially in Larkspur Landing, um, since we don't have a robust transit like anywhere else <laughs> to take them anywhere yeah. else in the community. So um, my guess is that people would still put in parking. It's, it, uh, and any, any, any way we can provide incentives for them to do that with project proposals to keep the parking connected with the development as opposed to having it spreading around the neighborhoods within a half mile radius of Larkspur Landing would be a good thing. Totally agree. <laughs> mm -hmm.
seriously i don't want come i don't want commuters to come parking their cars in, in our in front of my house and then yeah. riding their and then riding their bikes to their work over larkspur landing that just doesn't make any sense to me at all i was gonna ask mr paulson because i had done um we had gotten some information from uh the i call it the wind cup project but it's it's it used to be tanview knolls now i think it's bell bell housing yeah, they've, they've, the they've, they've, changed, site. They, they've changed their name about three different times so they had provided us with some parking information uh, to say that the parking that was required there and how it's working out. Um, and then I was going to do more research for Mr. Paulson on um, on other parking in the city because um, as we look at par reducing parking standards, I'm wondering if I could not do that research at this point. Um, I guess we'd still need the information for areas outside of Larkspur Landing. Um, it, it could be useful if we could get some comparable projects for the, maybe the smaller developments that might occur um, downtown. Um, if we're talking about reducing the parking standards elsewhere, but at least for Larkspur Landing, um, I don't think it's it doesn't it seem it seems somewhat pointless to to do some research on parking standards there since we can't require them anyway. Yeah, and I think that the wind cup stuff showed that the compliance was fine you know it was i don't think they had any problems and in, yeah i mean we had a long discussion about parking a couple of meetings ago and you know i, I think yeah if, if if you don't think there's more need for research that's fine i think as it or maybe related to downtown it would be useful or in north magnolia um reducing parking standards there but those are going to be smaller projects right right Okay. Does it? Yeah. So I don't have anything else to add unless anyone else has something to add. We we did receive recently the um, let's see what's on the we've got public comment next on the agenda. Um, we received um, information from our from the county retained affirmatively furthering fair housing consultant who's analyzed our sites. Um, I haven't had a chance to read through that yet, but that means that our our housing element draft will be closer to coming to you. So um, as soon as we get get those um, plugged into the draft. So I'm hoping to bring a housing element draft to this committee soon. And at the very least, we thought um, at the next meeting, we could go over the affirmatively furthering fair housing policies um, and, and talk about which programs to put in to the housing element. Um, that might be a topic for the next meeting. Yeah, that would be good. Meeting. And do we have that scheduled? It's that's actually scheduled for the 26th. Are all, are all of these still available on the 26th? Of this, month, of this month? Yeah, that's what I have on my calendar at least. The next one after that, I think that's all we scheduled. Yeah. We don't have anything scheduled beyond that. I've got that on the 26th, so. Yeah, I think I do too. Yep, yep. So the, the topic would be affirmative, the, going over the affirmatively furthering fair housing policies. So. Yeah, and, and, I, and I look forward to that conversation. I think that's an important one. Uh, and then hopefully in November, we'll come to you with the draft of the housing element. So, hey, just to kind of sum up everything we talked Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't know if you were done. I, I was just going to say to sum up, it sounds like program, you know, given that you're still looking at some things that seemed like something to pursue, didn't have many downsides, trans, a lot of questions and may not work out. I mean, is that is that a fair read of kind of, you know, um, summarizing, you know, the sentiment of the group and, and your your sense of, of our options? Um, it, you cut out again, but I think what you were talking about was the that pro housing application. And uh, my hope is that if we get council approval to go forward, I would go forward with the programs that we're already pursuing. And then some of the additional ones that that you were somewhat interested in looking at further, those might come back to you as housing element programs, but not necessarily. Um, where I'm, my hope is that we qualify for the pro housing based on our existing programs. And then um, at worst, we would put in some of these ones that we talked tonight as future programs that the city might pursue. Okay, okay, great. Yep, uh, that's pretty much what, what I thought. You know, the pro is 
is the most like desirable attractive at the moment. Yeah. And okay. Are, are you planning on bringing back the um, sale of accessory dwelling? Yes. To the yeah. planning commission because yes. we kind of. So that, that'll be coming that back. <laughs> so that'll be coming back um, as soon as I incorporate the new height limits into the ordinance. Um, so, which was kind of, it was good timing that you didn't make a recommendation on it since it has to return anyway. Um, okay. So you'll see another draft of that that incorporates the, the housing limits that need to go into effect before the end or before next in 2023. Right. Yeah. And then the city, so that'll be a recommendation to the city council and then the city council will see it the new um, or the revised accessory dwelling unit regulations after that. Yeah, if you can get it to us is uh, with enough time because it was like 60 pages that I got three days before our meeting. Yes, hopefully <laughs> if I'll, I'm gonna try to work on it soon, like Friday is when I have it scheduled and then move it along. So hopefully we can give you much more adequate time to, to review okay. it. <laughs> Is there anything else? Um, anyone from the public want to make a comment? There aren't any hands raised. Well, thank you all for those comments. Thank you thank for you. the yeah. great presentation. That's right. a lot to um, digest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> At least one one request. Could you send those decks? I, I took as many notes as I could. Oh, sure. but, um, there were two, yeah, especially the laws. I think I got the list that I could, but I, I probably would want to go over it again. And then there were a lot of details in, in the other two as well. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Sure, I'll show okay, that. Okay, super great. Okay. And and I it just, you know, you've been sending stuff and I've been trying to catch up. I mean, I, I how much volume there is here, and I certainly didn't want to throw more things your way. I just thought, hey, have we thought about this? You know, so. Yeah, no, no, it's, they're good because they're things I was thinking about for these these um, programs. Okay, awesome. And Gabe, I hope you weren't taking notes while you were pushing your kid around in a stroller. Yeah, I was. <laughs> That's not a good thing to do. Actually, I, know. I, was in part of, I was in part of the police station too, so I was really taking risks. <laughs> yeah, that's was really good. Please, please try to be more careful when you're doing that sort of thing. We, we don't want we don't want to lose any city council members to uh, inadvertent accidents, or or babies, <laughs> or babies. And, 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 yeah, we, we could lose the city council members, but the kids are fine. We got to keep them. Yeah. No, this was great, Elise. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll yeah, thank soon. you, Elise. You're doing a great job. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Thanks. All right. See you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Have a good evening, everybody. Yep.